I love the old hymns. Sometimes I open a hymn book and just read the words to some of my favorite hymns, which is almost better than reading the Bible because of the poet's interpretation of the Bible is so satisfactory to me. Her level of expertise is, is really very, very high. Uh, it's uh, beyond what we would just say genuinely first rate. She's one of the very bright stars uh, that Detroiters can point to with pride. Uh, not only is she doing what she's doing in terms of the publishing and the writing, but she taught here. She was invested in the children of Detroit. She's a star. It's important when you feel, when you feel the spirit, to get it on paper before you lose it. But once you have it on paper, that's just the beginning. Nobody else was doing what she was doing, and to be a woman in Detroit doing that was amazing. Definitely Detroit has brought and welcomed Naomi into its, its kind of metaphorical arms, and, and I think she's embraced it. Obviously, she's the Poet Laureate, so that means something. As the Poet Laureate of Detroit, she has served the city, she has provided opportunities for writers, and she has also interfaced with uh, the writing community on very meaningful levels. Uh, she's the author of, I think, nine books of poetry, and uh, she also has a memoir, which you absolutely have to get, um, Pilgrim Journey. So I'm going to sit down so that you can hear her words instead of my words about her words. Thank you. I assure you this is not a throne, but the old lady just has to sit down. <laughs> My husband's family um, goes back many generations in Detroit, and uh, we used to visit his sister, sit on the porch, and listen to the traffic noises on Linwood at the corner of, of Burlingame. And I always had a sense of peace sitting there. Uh, I knew I was going to write a poem uh, about sitting on the front porch there, but it all came together when uh, my sister-in-law's grandchildren were spending the night, and my sister-in-law and my husband got into a disagreement about who one of their ancestors was. Uh, there are a number of things that are negative about living in the city of Detroit, and they are the ones that always get in the newspapers. But there are also some wonderful things about neighborhoods where people are really, really look out for each other. So I hope the uh, negative aspects that I speak of in the poem uh, are minor to the wonderful things about it. My windows and doors are barred against the intrusion of thieves. The neighbor's dogs howl in pain at the screech of sirens. There is nothing you can tell me about the city I do not know. On the front porch, it is cool and quiet after the high-pitched panic passes. The windows across the street gleam in the dark. There is a faint suggestion of moon shadow above the golden street light. 
The grandchildren are asleep upstairs, and we are happy for their presence. The conversation comes around to Grandpa Henry, thrown into the Detroit River by an Indian woman, seeking to save him from the sinking ship. Or was he the one who was the African prince employed to oversee the chained slave cargo, preventing their rebellion, and for reward, set free? The family will never settle it. Somebody lost the history that they had so carefully preserved. Insurance rates are soaring. It is not safe to walk the streets at night. The news reports keep telling us the things they need to say. The case is hopeless. But the front porch is cool and quiet. The neighbors are dark and warm. The grandchildren are upstairs dreaming. And we are happy for their presence. Detroit was the center of a lot of, of literary growth. I mean, Dudley Randall was here, and a lot of fine poets around Wayne State University and when, in her early years here, before she founded Lotus Press. And then Lotus Press has kind of has become, um, you know, the godmother of African American poetry. With Dudley Randall on the one hand and Naomi on the other, they're just two pillars of African American publishing. I didn't do this by myself, you know. I didn't give myself the talent. And so I, I have to use it and, and I, use, I have to pass on to other poets the encouragement that I received. Publishing uh, for Naomi has allowed her to uh, give to the canon of American literature and to um, the academy a variety of poets that they would have normally ignored or missed for some strange reason. Two poets immediately come to mind. One is Dolores Kendrick and the second is Toy Derricotti. And both of those were first published with Naomi, but have gone on to major publishing houses. When I got that letter that said that Lotus Press was publishing my first book, The Empress of the Death House, I screamed so loud that everybody in my neighborhood, <laughs> I, I guess they thought I really had lost my mind. That was that finally <laughs> the other shoe dropped, you know. Um, it was unbelievable. And I think now, and of course looking back, for me to have been published by an African-American woman must have said to me, somehow you always pass this down. Whenever you're doing work for other people, the people you do it for, they're absorbing that. And they, they take on the mantle. I mean, what she gave to me, I'm giving to others. And I realize now that, uh, that this is about the gift, you know, it's passing through us. We don't own it. Um, it's, not about, it's not about me. It's not even about her. It's about that thing that has to be expressed. Langston Hughes was such a wonderful human being. And he was always so encouraging uh, to, to younger poets, and uh, so was Gwen Brooks. And that's the kind of, I don't, I don't want to be full of myself. Um, I, I want to, by, by establishing Lotus Press, uh, I felt that publishing other poets was more important than, than the work as one poet. Well, she has nine books. And you, somebody tell me how she did this, I do not know. Um, because she, you would think she gave her whole life for other people. I mean, in that she's published 90 books of poetry by, by poets, a lot of them first books, which is so incredibly important in the world of poetry to have a book. 
it changes your whole life to have a book. Um, but when was she writing her own poems? You know, I would talk to her on the phone and she would say, you know, she was working on a poem, but she'd always say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm just so much work that I'm doing for so-and-so's book. And, and, you know, she w that was what she was talking about. Mostly she would be talking about other people's work. I have been given so much that I have to, I have to give back. I owe. How many places did you live when you were growing up? Well, I was born in Norfolk, Virginia, but we left there when I was about 18 months old. So the only first home I remember was in East Orange, New Jersey. And we stayed there in 1925 until December 1937 when my father took a church in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And I went through high school there. I'm going to read um, a poem that took me 70 years to write about my mother. My father was a minister and he was always in the public eye. Uh, my mother was a stay-at-home mom doing all of the drudgery that women did without modern conveniences during the Depression. And she was always tired. So I didn't want to be like her. I wanted to be like my father. It took me a long time to realize how much she really, really meant to me. This is called Reluctant Light. Mother, I didn't mean to slight you, but it wasn't you that I adored. You hid your energy in shadows, and I was dazzled by the sun. I idolized the one whose voice soared to prophetic heights, whose words rejuvenated epics of the ages. Some fine June Sundays, slender and magnificent in morning coat, he would electrify the pulpit with eloquent pronouncements of doom and glory so divine, the very gates of heaven seemed to part, bathing the atmosphere in crystal light. Seeking his favor, I rehearsed raising my hand like his in benediction, earning the childhood name of preacher, shortened in time to preet. You gave us daily sustenance, but there was never a choir's fanfare or the soul beat of the mighty to grant applause. You baked the bread for which we seldom thanked you, canned pears for winter, and mended depression-weary clothes, scrubbing sheets on a washboard, humming hymns to lift your sagging spirit, and cultivating beauty in endless flower pots. The summer when he toured the streets of ancient Palestine and Rome, you consoled yourself by painting pictures of the Appian Way using the kitchen table for an easel. You coached me with my homework, rejoiced in my small triumphs, and prepared me to confront the enemy, tapping your umbrella against my fifth grade teacher's desk to punctuate your firm demand for justice. I didn't recognize your subtle power that led me through blind, airless caves, your quiet elegance that taught me dignity, nor could I know the wind that bore him high into the sunlight emanated from your breath. I didn't want your journey, rebelled against your sober ways. But I have walked through my own shadows and, like you, transcended glitter. I have learned that I am source and substance of a different kind of light. Now when they say I look like you and tell me that I have deepened to your wisdom, softened to your easy grace, I claim my place with honor in that court of dusky queens whose strength and beauty invented sons that others only borrow. And mother, I am glad to be your child.
Now I have to read the one about my father. Uh, in the Depression, uh, during the Depression, people used to come to the back door begging for food. And uh, sometimes they didn't want food, they wanted money to buy bootleg booze because it was during uh, Prohibition. But my mother always uh, made a sandwich for them until one day she went around the house and saw that the man had thrown the sandwich in the bushes. And she said, uh, told my father, I'm gonna stop giving these men my good food when they don't want it. And his answer is in the poem. And uh, you know how kids drop things on the floor. Dad would say, pick that up. And we might say, I didn't, I didn't drop it. And he would say, the answer is in this poem. <laughs> he lives in me. My father was a strong and stalwart man. Slight of build, he towered over cities and had the might of armies. Light of skin, he was the blackest man I knew. In the unbeautiful years, he taught me pride. When despair was ready to engulf me, he rescued me with hope. By his hands, in his arms, I was immersed in waters of integrity and truth. I learned my lessons at his knee. The just shall live by faith. If a beggar asks for food but isn't hungry, that's his problem. If you turn him away, and he really is, it's yours. And it isn't your responsibility to take the measure of his guile or honest need. If you see a toy with jagged edges, any obstruction, dropped on the floor or in the way, it doesn't matter if you put it there or not. You see it. You must remove it or you're just as guilty, maybe more so, as the one who left it there. I am my father's daughter. I make no apologies for being who I am, for having learned integrity early in life. Make no excuses that my neighborhood was haven because my parents loved me and loved each other and made our home rock in a weary land. I go out of my way to kick banana peels or broken glass from sidewalks try to remove obstacles, no matter who put them there. I will not apologize. I cannot speak of him in metaphor or symbol. My father was upright, noble, and uncompromised, and he gave me all I needed to be proud, moral, and black, and whole. I can only praise him now with hallelujahs, trumpets, cymbals, and drums. East Orange was the most prejudiced city in the North that I can think of. Uh, the school system did not have a single black employee, not even a janitor. And each of the grades uh, had three divisions, A, B, and C. In the A division, there might have been one black student or none. In the B, there might have been six. And all the Italians and black kids were in the C division. My older brother had already started school and he was put in 2C. And my second brother was in the B division and I was the only black child in the A division through the eighth grade. And uh, the prejudice that I experience there and and throughout the city you wouldn't believe um, there was a, a line in in one of my poems uh, about my mother reluctant light about her tapping her umbrella on the fifth grade teacher's desk demanding justice um, there was a, a contest in one of the grades uh, for reciting poetry. And mother, my mother 
we decided on the poem I was going to recite, not an original poem. And she drilled me and drilled me and drilled me to make sure that I recited with, with uh, expression. And as I listened to the other kids recite, I knew I was better than they were. I didn't get first, second, third, or fourth prize. And the, my teacher told my mother, everybody knows Naomi won that. And my father wanted to continue his education, so he enrolled at uh, Uppsala College in East Orange, and he was the first black graduate. And he was pastoring a church full time and had a wife and three children at home. But he was the uh, highest ranking student in his class. The president called him in and said, we're not gonna let you make the valedictory address. And if you insist, we will never admit another Negro. So my father said he didn't care about making the speech, but he wanted recognition for his achievement. So they printed it on the program. But another student, a white student, made the address. And then when my brothers got to high school, uh, they had a friend who spent a lot of time at our house. He was very, very talented and very personable. Uh, all the kids loved Irving Washington. And uh, they wanted to, the students wanted to uh, run him for student council. They wouldn't even let them put his name on the ticket. And uh, uh, when my brothers uh, reported that the uh, swimming classes were, were separate, my father and another minister went and complained and they closed the pool and it never opened again. Well, when my father accepted the church in St. Louis, he told me about this all black high school I would be going to. And I had never seen so many, not all of them were middle class, but I had never seen so many middle class black kids in my life in one place. It, it was the turning point of my life. Um, the first week I was there, I enrolled right after the Christmas holidays in 1938. And the first week I was there, there was a National Honor Society induction ceremony. It's the most beautiful and solemn thing I had ever seen in my life. And it was absolutely quiet. The teachers didn't have to stand in the aisles to keep order. And I was just so impressed. I, I've got to do that. And then it might have been, I think it was the same assembly, this unassuming little 16-year-old boy got up on the stage and sang in a baritone voice like I have never heard before or since. I looked down from that balcony and I said, here is a place you can be anything you're good enough to be. And I took off running. Mm -hmm. That was a turning point of my life. A few years later, I'm in Detroit. It was in the 50s. And there was an item there, Negro Makes Met. I said, that's Robert McFerrin. It had to be. And of course it was. And we stayed in touch until his death several years ago. But um, everything at Sumner High School, it was the oldest, the first black high school west of the Mississippi. And everything was academic excellence. And it, it was just, if I had never gone to St. Louis, I don't know, you know, my life would have been very different. And the black community there was so supportive of anybody who was doing anything. Mm -hmm. I did my first poetry reading over the radio when I was 15. And I was always being asked to do readings, even as a teenager. And so was Robert. Uh, he would do concerts, you know, and it, it just made all the difference in my life. I want to read something from what is still my favorite of, of the books I have written, Octavia, Guthrie and Beyond, but it's hard to excerpt from that because it tells the story of the life of my father's sister who died three years before I was born. She was only 34 years old 
and died of tuberculosis, and he really never got over her death, but I was said to have looked like her. And I heard so much about her, and I was a skinny little kid, and my father was always telling me, if you don't take better care of yourself, you're going the way of Octavia, to the point that I, f I began to feel that I was Octavia reincarnated. When, as a child, I wore your face, Octavia, three years returned to Earth, and christened with your name, set forth on my own odyssey. I had no clothing of my own, only depressive hand-me-downs, frayed remnants of someone else's outgrown legacy. My father dressed me in your skin, and such a garment woven of his fabrication of a second chance was not to be discarded easily. Gagged on emulsions, tonics, and home remedies contrived to save me from your early death, I was injected with your blood. Your spirit hovered above me like a constant cloud threatening disaster. Having escaped your first name, too poignant a reminder of your brother's grief, I was still branded with a second tormented by chastisement for your careless ways. We were 16, and your girl round face stared from my mirror. Your long curl fell over my shoulder. The smoldering coals of your eyes ignited mine. How your rebellious words flung from my mouth must have grieved my father. Yet his transcendent love for both of us always forgave. How could he not remember planting the seed that sprouted into weeds that choked out my identity? You outgrew the likeness, he told me, but by then it was too late. Reincarnated in my blood, you were determined not to die. Your flesh was bonded to my bones, my feet shod in your stylish high-buttoned shoes. Early discontent creased my forehead with your frown. Your spirit immersed me, and I sank down and down, swirled in the whirlpool of your eyes and drowned. I think that she receives a great deal of satisfaction because perhaps in her mind the circle is complete, that she got so much from her own heritage. And now she's able to give back not only to others, but to stand beside those who made accomplishments that made her who she is. We would like to present you with the first Ebony Lotus Literary Lotus Award, 2010. I'm so honored to be here today to help honor Detroit's Poet Laureate, and I'm so happy to see all of you. As a poet in the city of Detroit, there's no way that I cannot know about our, our Poet Laureate, but um, when I was invited to this event, I had an opportunity to really spend some time um, with your work, and I was just blown away by these pieces from Connected Islands. And So here's another one, Fragments of a Dream. A letter has fallen out of my name. It tumbles over and over itself. I can't retrieve it, and without it, I don't know who I am. I follow it to St. Mark's Square, but it turns into pigeons that turn into worms. Everywhere I step, they squish and squirm, and I have no wings. I am clinging to the edge of a star, trying to capture the missing letter. I can't hold on much longer. I will disintegrate before I hit the earth. Even the smallest deletion changes the alphabet, the order of the universe. 
as a stuck piano key alters a song and I am falling incomplete, anonymous, my heart still pulsing. I feel the air move as the lid of my coffin is lowered. My mouth is full of sand and I can't cry out for someone to give me back myself. I want to die easy when I die. This is no way to go. Sod heavy on my chest. My eyes are glued shut and I can't read the name on my headstone. Thank you. Fragments of a Dream meant a lot to me because um, there's some things that I've been going to and talking about being able to relate and, and transcend uh, the commonalities that transcend age. That poem really spoke to some personal things that I've been dealing with. And so it was very beautiful to be able to take another poet's words and, and apply them to my own experience. It's pure, I think. There's not a lot of um, puffed upness about her language. You know, there's a simplicity that, that that's that's not to be mistaken for something that's too easy. You know, it's it's hard to be really clear and really concise. Um, a lot of times when you read poetry, the images are so convoluted and it's just so deep that you need a shovel and a bunch of dynamite to, to, to understand what the poet is writing. And I say this as a poet, but some of the times I just don't get it. And, and what I love about her poetry, there is um, definitely strong technique and, and there's uh, attention paid to form, but it's simple and it's in language that you can understand. The images are images that, that, that evoke the everyday. And, and I appreciate that about her poetry. You don't have to study poetry in a classroom. But if you read a lot of good poetry, you're going to learn what good poetry is by osmosis. And by example, uh, it's just going, you'll just learn what a good poem is. Uh, I, I started writing very young, and I read poetry all the time. And uh, I started, well, every, most poems rhymed when I was young. Uh, that was all, that was the only kind of poetry we had in the textbook, so l most of my early poems are rhymed. Uh, it wasn't until I got into high school that I started writing free verse. I had been writing all my life, and my first poem was published in the Orange Daily Courier when I was 13, and um, in the Poet's Corner. And uh, my father was, and parents, my parents were very encouraging. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father thought that my poems were good enough to be published. So he submitted them to uh, a small publisher. Uh, he had to guarantee so many sales. It was a hardcover, very small hardcover book, Songs to a Phantom Nightingale. Great title. And, uh, um, he had to guarantee so many sales, but it was only a dollar. And he knew ministers all over the country, so he knew that he could sell those books. And he would send them to, to his friends and, uh, you know, for approval. And of course, everybody bought them. She's very, uh, very much about the excellence of the craft. And she is widely read, you know, Phyllis Wheatley is one of her inspirations. She knew County Cullen and Langston Hughes personally, you know, so she has many, many connections um, in the poetry world, in the poetry arena. So uh, I think she's a poet too that poets like to go back to, to read, you know. The more you know her, the more you want to know. I'm so glad trouble don't always last, which as you know is from a Negro spiritual, at least you should. Uh, <laughs> Soon I will be done. All my life, I've been waiting for trouble to pass. If it wasn't a flood, it was a drought. If it wasn't the bull weevil, it was white folks trying to take our land. Soon as we built a house big enough for all the kids, they raised the taxes. Then Papa died and Mama come to live with us with all her furniture because brothers say we only ones got that much room. Soon as son get out of trouble, Susie come up pregnant. 
We was all proud of Junior when he came back home from Vietnam with medals and honors and his picture in the paper till police has gunned him down, robbing a grocery store. At least that's what they told us. I used to sing in church, and truly, I did believe soon we would be done with the troubles of the world, going home to live with God. But I bet you anything, soon as I get to heaven, the golden stairs is going to fall down, and God's going to say, Sister Johnson, see, can you give us a hand here? Sure as anything, I'm going to be the one who has to build them up again. Thank you. It's an energy. I think people, a lot of people probably talk about her energy. Uh, well, that probably comes up a lot when people mention her. She, uh, she has a presence that's, um, that's amazing. And it's, it's a similar presence to um, Lucille Clifton. I had the pleasure of meeting Lucille Clifton um, before she passed. And uh, it's a similar energy that just commands respect um, where um, you just feel like you need to just kind of be quiet and just be present um, when you're around her. And uh, so that's what it's kind of like to meet with her. And me personally, I kind of I fumble over my words a little bit and I'm kind of like, um, it's almost like this feeling of, um, you know you're you, right? Like, I mean, do you, and I always wonder if these people know who they are. Like, <laughs> like does Naomi Long Vajet really knows she's Naomi, you know? <laughs> she is never too busy for anybody doing something in the community to offer her assistance, to offer her counsel, to offer her help. Or if it's some kind of a reading, she's never, you know, uh, turns it down. I mean, if, you know, if she's not doing something prior. She's always accessible. I guess that's the thing. I went to Virginia State. It was college then. Uh, in fact, it was the last year that the school was technically called Virginia State College for Negroes. There is no experience to uh, equal going to an all-black college uh, and, and living in a dormitory. Freshmen had uh, one Sunday, an hour one Sunday, that they could socialize, which was what the, uh, the president called it. And uh, if you were caught socializing at some other time, you were likely to be sent to the uh, guidance committee, which I was. <laughs> but, um, but it was just a great experience. I became an Alpha Kappa Alpha woman in 1942. Did you study English? Was that your major? Or? What else? <laughs> I was a natural at English. There was no no doubt about what I was going to major in. Even if you intend to write in free verse, I think it's like learning the scales of, uh, if you're going to take piano lessons. That's basic to understand form uh, because all, uh, all language has rhythm. Um, if you say a sentence, there is rhythm to the sentence. There are ex accented and unaccented uh, syllables. And uh, if you don't understand form, you're likely to write a free verse poem where the syllables bump into each other and don't form a pleasant rhythm. I was about 15 years old when he uh, did a reading at a women's literary club in St. Louis. And uh, I told him that I was writing poetry and uh, he gave me a copy of a new song, which I still have autographed. And um, he, he advised me not to ever pay to have my poetry published. And uh, then the next time I saw him, I was at Virginia State, and he was to do a reading that evening. And I met with him in the afternoon prior to the reading uh, and handed him uh, a typed loose leaf notebook of my poems, some of my poems, and asked him if he had a chance, would he look at a few of them and tell me what he thought. So I noticed that when he went to the platform, he had my notebook with him, but that was not strange to me. But in the middle of his reading, he read several of my poems, 
and he said, those poems were written by one of your fellow students. And my head got really big with the praise that he offered. And uh, when I went to get the book back and he noticed that I was waiting at the edge of the stage, he left the group he was talking to and gave it back to me. And he had gone through the whole thing and penciled in comments which I immediately covered with scotch tape so that they wouldn't get erased. You know, I, I tell students all the time, uh, they, some of them seem to think they don't want to spoil the spontaneity of the poem. So the way it, first way it comes out, that's the way it has to stay. There's nothing sacrosanct about spontaneity. How long um, have you lived in Detroit? I came here as a young bride in 1946, shortly after I graduated from co college. And I've been here ever since. Well, Jill was born uh, a little over a year after we got here. I had met her father at Sumner High School in St. Louis. He was getting ready to graduate when I came. and. He introduced himself in, in the hall, and then um, he went to Lincoln University in Missouri and was my brother's roommate for a while. And our, our high school choir toured the state, and we stopped at Lincoln University, and I saw him going across the campus, and we spoke. And then I didn't see him again until uh, during the war he was stationed at Camp Lee and somebody told him that Long's sister was on campus. So he looked me up, and that was the beginning of, of the romance. Mm -hmm. But um, he was shortly shipped out, and uh, he went to Paso, Texas, El Paso, Texas first, and then to Hawaii. And after he came home, then we got married. But he had been in Detroit before that and decided that Detroit was where he wanted to settle. He was in Detroit during the 1943 riot. He was shot in the back by state troopers at the, on the steps of the St. Antoine Y. Uh, they had just come back from the Lucy Thurman YWCA across the street, which served meals. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the state trooper was chasing a, a black boy down the street and Julian said, uh, Heil Hitler. And they turned around and shot him in the back mm. and left him lying there for a long time. It was just a flesh wound. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, we were in, living in New Rochelle. Mm -hmm. And uh, my brother said, uh, you know, I think Spoon is in Detroit. And if he's in Detroit, he's in the riot. And the next day, we picked up the paper and read about his being shot. So he knew him. Huh? He knew him. <laughs> well, the marriage with Julian Witherspoon broke up after three years. But I had uh, already published my first book under the name Naomi Cornelia Long. And some of my poems were published in an anthology and also in the Michigan Chronicle, where I worked shortly after I came to Detroit under the name Naomi L. Witherspoon. Uh, after six years, I met and married uh, William Harold Madgett. And it was under that name that I became much better known. I taught under that name. It was 13 years before that marriage broke up and I, well, it broke up after six years, but it was 13 years after that that I married again. I had determined that I was never going to marry again because I didn't trust my own judgment. But uh, after his first wife died and we got to be friends, uh, he was just too good to pass up. That was the marriage that worked. We were married for 24 years until his death. I decided that I was going to keep the name Magic because I had run un, uh, into uh, 
Dorothy Porter, who was then the head librarian at Howard University. And she said, Naomi, please don't change your name again, because it took me years to fi figure out that Witherspoon and Madgett were the same person. And so I did everything I could to keep the name Andrews out of print. Someone, when I was teaching at Eastern Michigan University, uh, someone in the library sent me a page from a bibliography that listed me as Naomi Cornelia Long Witherspoon Magic. I said, no more. It is lonely in the creation process, but you are very fortunate if you have an informal group to share your poems with, uh, people who are uh, as good as you are, who can critique your poems and tell you what they see in them because we know what we mean, but sometimes the poem doesn't come through to the other person. When my second book was published, uh, it was a very dry period nationally. There were not, I mean, you could count the number of black poets who were getting published on, on one hand. And uh, when my book came out, it caused such a stir that it was written up in all of the papers. And I uh, was invited to do a reading of as far away as Philadelphia. And I read in Grand Rapids. And I mean, it was such an unusual thing to have a book of poetry published. Uh, and I didn't know anybody, any other black poet in Detroit. Eventually, I met uh, Oliver Legrone, who was also a sculptor. And we were the only two black poets that we knew of in Detroit. Rosie Poole came from the Netherlands, but she was living in London then. And uh, she came for an extended visit. And the black poets in, in the United States were so well known in Europe, she didn't think she would be telling Americans about American poets. But uh, she did a lot of lectures and she had a radio program, Black and Unknown Bards. And uh, through her visit, we found out that there were other black poets. And I don't know at what point I met Dudley Randall, but uh, he came back to Detroit the same year my second book was published, in 1956. But I eventually met him. And then there were some others. Uh, who didn't write as much poetry or wrote occasionally, occasional poetry. Uh, Edward Simpkins, mm -hmm. um, Harold Lawrence, um, Betty Ford, and there was a high school girl, I think her name was Gloria Davis, if I'm not mistaken. But we, we started meeting at each other's houses informally and discussing each other's poetry and making suggestions and whatnot. And eventually, Margaret Danner came to Detroit, and she was supposed to be on her way to Africa. She had gotten a grant to go to Africa. But uh, instead, she um, asked a minister uh, of a church that owned a vacant house next door if she could live there and use it as, a, as a, an art center. Uh, and the minister's name was Theodore Boone. So we called it Boone House. We got together once a month and read to each other mainly. Uh, we put on a program at, at Hartford Avenue Baptist Church called Poetry Unlimited. And uh, all of us read there. And there was a big turnout and uh, some publicity about it. And uh, people talked about it for years after that. I think we met there not two years. I can't remember exactly how long it was. But all of a sudden, Margaret disappeared. And nobody knew where she was. And uh, so the group broke up. and. Her, uh, James Thompson moved to New York, and 
uh, um, Harold Lawrence changed his name to Kofi Wangara and moved to Africa, and the group just sort of fell apart. Eventually, it turned out that uh, Margaret had uh, used the money that she was supposed to go to Africa with, and she was finally getting ready to go. And then there was a second group that was interracial. Rosie Poole was the catalyst that brought us together. And uh, she was well thought of for a long time until it got to the point that because she was white, people who had been friendly with her uh, resented the fact that, that she was involved so much with, with black poetry. But she had been dealing with African-American poetry since she was, had been a student at um, uh, the university in Amsterdam. I gave her some poems when she left. Uh, I said, do, do what you want to with them. I didn't know if she was going to include them in her anthology or what. And uh, one day, uh, Dudley, who was a librarian at that time, called me and said, uh, uh, I see you've been published in um, uh, Freedom Ways magazine. I said, no, I haven't. He said, I'm looking right at it. <laughs> so she had given it, and uh, that's how it got published in Freedom Ways, but I wasn't even aware that it was, that it was, it was uh, there. It was there, it was in print. When did you first meet Robert Hayden? You know, I don't really remember when I met him. Uh, I taught at uh, University of Michigan uh, one semester, one class, while I was still teaching it at EMU. And uh, I saw him one time. His office was next to the office I had borrowed. But uh, it was just wonderful knowing that he was there. But Dudley and, and uh, Bob Hayden and I did a joint reading at a community college, Oakland Community College. So when we left there, uh, Dudley was driving him back to Ann Arbor. And I sat in the, I went along for the ride and sat in the back seat with him. And we talked about, um, you know, the forces that, that tried to make all black writers write the same way or the responsibility of the writers to fight the poets to uh, fight the battle. And we both felt that nobody has a right to tell a poet what to write about. I have written seriously flawed poems, um, and I didn't know how to fix them. I knew where the problems were, but I never knew how to fix them. Midway is one of those. Uh, it's my most popular poem. It has been reprinted more than any other poem I've ever written, recited, set to music, uh, publicly performed, and it has lived a life of its own, but I'm not satisfied with it. I know what's wrong with it, but I don't know how to fix it. Midway is, is probably not flawed. You know what is the, the problem with this poem may be that it's so direct. It is a poem that sums up slavery and segregation. And those are two different moods and two different periods that happen in the American experience. That's the first thing. Uh, the poem skirts around dialect, which was from the 19th century, and it appropriates a vernacular speech, which belongs to the 20th century. And that's another element that I think. Part of the problem that maybe allows Naomi to think that it is flawed is, is because it is an angry poem uh, in some ways. I wrote it in 1958, I think, which was shortly after the Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Topeka, Kansas. Uh, and because the law was on the side of justice concerning civil rights for the first time, 
uh, black people were determined never to go back to the way things were. And I called it midway because even though some progress had been made, we still had a long way to go. I've come this far to freedom and I won't turn back. I'm climbing to the highway from my old dirt track. I'm coming and I'm going and I'm stretching and I'm growing and I'll reap what I've been sowing on my skin's not black. I've prayed and slaved and waited and I've sung my song. You've bled me and you've starved me, but I've still grown strong. You've lashed me and you've treed me and you've everything but freed me, but in time you'll know you need me and it won't be long. I've seen the daylight breaking high above the bow. I've found my destination and I've made my vow. So whether you abhor me or deride me or ignore me, mighty mountains loom before me and I won't stop now. Now, you know, the, the poem determines its own form. The line that came to me was, I've come this far to freedom and I won't turn back. I was stuck with that, unless I wanted to change the line, which I didn't. It maybe does not have the metaphorical subtleties that uh, mark and distinguish many of Naomi's poems, and that may be what troubles her about it. It's not that subtle. It is just a straightforward uh, declaration of an experience. And there's nothing wrong with that when that experience is honestly presented. And I think that maybe we sometimes shy away from uh, that kind of presentation. You taught high school in Detroit. I was determined never to teach, but <laughs> I gradually realized that I was a born teacher. But it took me a long time to come to that realization. Uh, most of the years that I taught in Detroit were at Northwestern High School, and I really loved it there. The parents were very supportive. It was almost completely black student body. And I thought that the students needed good teachers. The English faculty was, was very good, and we were very congenial. We would sometimes have impromptu parties after school at somebody's house. I introduced the first course in African American literature uh, in a summer school class. And um, Melvin B. Tolson was in town. Mm -hmm and he came to our class. Mm. And his way of teaching was, was very interesting. And then it became a regular part of the curriculum and the first um, accredited creative writing class I also introduced. Um, and Pearl Clegg, mm. who is now a famous playwright and uh, fiction writer, uh, was one of my students. I was uh, one of the pioneers in uh, uh, getting textbook changes because when I was teaching at Northwestern, we used a book called Adventures in American Literature. I remember it. And the only thing it had in it was one poem by Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, The Creation by James Weldon Johnson, an article about uh, George Washington Carver and one about Mary, Mary McLeod Bethune. Mm -hmm. And um, um, George Wash Washington Carver's picture was in the book. When I saw the uh, uh, contents of the revised edition, they had removed everything except the creation. Wow. And I wrote a letter to the editor, and I said, I'm not going to use this book. They said, well, we, don't, we aren't aware of uh, the race of the people who we're dropping. I said, yes, you are, because George Washington Carver was a dark-skinned 
black man, and you couldn't remove the article about him without realizing that, that it was a black man. Mm -hmm. And then their excuse for taking out Gwendolyn Brooks' poem was that they tried to include somebody young, and they realized she wasn't young anymore. So I, I really made my own rules. We were supposed to, you know, we couldn't choose our own textbooks. But I made my own rules, and I went out and bought some paperback books and had the students buy them from me mm -hmm. and instead of from the bookstore. And I refused to use any of the textbooks mm -hmm. because they were so deficient. In 1968, Frank Ross, who had been the supervisor of secondary school English teachers, uh, asked me if I wanted to teach at Eastern Michigan University. Well, I didn't think I was qualified, but um, he uh, talked to the department head and I finally went for an interview and I was appointed as an associate professor there. And as soon as I was qualified to get tenure, I got it. And as soon as I was qualified for a promotion, I became a full professor. And I was there for 16 years. I introduced the first uh, undergraduate um, African-American literature class there, and then a graduate class in the Harlem Renaissance. Some of the students became so angry, that the, white students, that they had never heard of these authors before. And they felt that their, their education had been deficient. Let's talk about you as publisher, the founding of Lotus Press. I had no intention of being a publisher, but I was ready for my third book to be published, Pink Ladies in the Afternoon, and I couldn't find a publisher for it. And uh, so uh, there were three people who were interested in my work who said that they would put up the money to have it printed, if I would do the legwork. And so I came up with the uh, uh, name Lotus Press, Flower of a New Nile. And uh, I thought they were going to try to promote the book after it was printed, but uh, they seemed to feel that they had done all that they wanted to do. And so uh, for a nominal fee, I took it over and, uh, and still didn't intend to publish anything else. But then I do crazy things like buying equipment and not knowing what I'm going to do with it, but thinking that eventually I'll find something to do with it. So I had bought a Gastetner dupl duplicator, which printed in, uh, to use d different tubes of color. And uh, the first thing I did was, uh, one of the white teachers said, uh, Oh, you, if you've read one black poet, you've read them all. And I knew that there was so much variety uh, in subject matter and style that I, I had to prove her wrong. So I used Guest Etna Duplicator to do 20, uh, I call them poster poems, they're really broadsides, of uh, 20 living black poets. And I wrote a teacher's guide to go with it. And um, the National Council of Teachers of English bought uh, 250 copies of that portfolio mm -hmm. to distribute. Mm -hmm. then, then I had this student at Eastern Michigan. And I thought, well, I've got this duplicator. Uh, and I could do a little chapbook of hers to encourage her. I didn't know the first thing about what I was doing. <laughs> to take advantage of the color, I printed it in dark blue ink on medium blue paper, and part of the design was in red. It was terrible looking. And I didn't know about putting the book together. It was going to be saddle stitched. And when I tried to collate the pages, they were all wrong. Mm -hmm. So I had to throw away all of those printed pages and start again. And I had to make a dummy and number the pages so I would know what 
-hmm. what page was opposite the other, what yeah. page when they were folded. But it, it, it was a horrible looking book, but I was so proud of it. Then I met Mae Miller, who was the daughter of uh, Kelly Miller, who used to be the dean at Howard University. She had been writing plays during the Harlem Renaissance, and then she turned to poetry, and she had had several books published before. So I published one, ended up publishing several of her books, including her collected poems in hardcover. And then it went on from there, and uh, I ended up getting people submitting their poetry, but it was never my intention to be a real publisher. But it was sort of the, the times. Well, I, I published po poetry that I liked. And uh, of course, Pinky Gordon Lane was a very good poet, and she had had books published before, but they didn't look as good. Eventually, uh, I started getting them the poems uh, typeset when I did Troy Derricott's first book, she wanted, wanted a typeset. Mm -hmm. And I found a man who would do it uh, in a very short time because I paid cash for everything. I never owed anybody anything. Mm -hmm. And I put a lot of my money, my own money, into the press to keep it going. Mm -hmm. But if I didn't have the money to do a book, I waited until I had the money. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we got um, a contribution large enough to buy a computer and a laser printer, and that was perfect. But, you know, we did it the hard way. Lotus Press exists and lives in the basement. Now, people have to understand, this is not an office. There, there, there's no. a computer, there are desks, there are shelves, but there are also many, many boxes. So much of her life is down there in those boxes. So it's not just, I think that, that it, it's just kind of a interwoven Lotus Press and her life. It's, it's just one for her. And last night I was down in the, in the basement rummaging through some of the boxes. And um, above the Lotus Press sign, there's a quote that's been there for many, many years. And it's a quote that my mother put there by Thomas Carlyle that says, the latest gospel in this world is know thyself. Long enough has this poor self of thine tormented thee. Thou will never get to know it, I believe. Think it not thy business, this knowing thyself. Thou art an unknowable individual, but know what thou can work at and work at it like a Hercules. That will be thy better plan. She was what we would call an exceptional editor. I do not change anything that they don't agree to. She would not allow you to be foolish uh, in print or in public. Uh, and she would question all sorts of little uh, grammatical details. What I do is to write the poet and go through certain lines identify the line and say, uh, this word that you're using here doesn't, doesn't mean what I understand it. Uh, it, doesn't, it. It isn't the right word for what I think you're trying to say. So I was very happy to have somebody like that uh, looking over my shoulder and saying, do you really want this word here or do you really want this comma or this period? Uh, it, it made the work seem much more professional and, I would dare say, exceptional. And there's nothing that I would insist on changing unless it was an unintentional grammatical error or a misspelling. One of the books I published, which is probably the most important one, is Adam of Ife. Black Women in Praise of Black Men. Somebody had to do a book like that because the black man is in terrible trouble. A lot of, of damage was done to emasculate uh, the, the black male, and he didn't get there by accident. 
many of them deserve uh, the negative comments that they get. But there are also a lot of wonderful black men and my father and my brothers were certainly among them uh, and many other black men that I have known um, who just do the things they're supposed to do and never make the hot headlines for crime. And somebody, and it needs to be women, to say, we see you, we recognize you, we hope you're, we, we are happy to have you in our lives. And uh, when I mentioned that I was going to do a book like this, one person said to me, uh, hmm, you must be expecting a teeny tiny little book. I said, uh, why, you, you've known some good black men in your life. Your father was a good man. She said, and he's the only one. And somebody else made a similar comment, so I didn't know what to expect. I thought if I got uh, maybe 60 pages of poetry, um, I'd be lucky. But the word got around, and I sent invitations to all of the black poets that I could locate. They came pouring in, and the book went into a second printing before the year was out. People were buying three and four copies for men and boys that they knew. And the, the men's reaction, you mean the sisters have something good to say about us? Which poem is your favorite? Well, one of my favorites um, is a poem I wrote when I was about 19 years old. So many of my early poems were melancholy. And uh, in this poem, I'm expressing the fact that sooner or later, I'm going to write a happy poem. And this is a poem, uh, Quest. I will track you down the years, down the night, till my anguish falls away star by star, and my heart spreads flaming wings where you are. I will find you, never fear, make you mine. Think that you have bound me fast to the earth. I will rise to sing you yet song of mirth. I will let you think you won, perfect dream, till I creep from dark and toil to your side, hold you to my heart and sleep satisfied. I will track you down the sky, down the blue, till my song becomes the sun of the years and the golden April rains are my tears. And so in 1984, you know, in graduate school, I asked my professor why I had never read an African-American poet at NYU. And he said, you know, we don't go down that low. Oh. So, okay, he said it. But don't you think other people might have been thinking it? And so, um, so just imagine that effect on, on the heart of a black poet, you know, on children coming up to have that desire or that sense and then to know you're not present in the world. There's some reason why there's nothing to mirror that back for you. And there was another difficulty too at a certain point in, in the evolution of, um, of us as African American writers. There was a moment in which you had to choose. Are you a poet or are you a black poet? You know, and I think of Lotus Press certainly as a continuation of the Harlem Renaissance, along with Dudley Randall at Broadside and Gwendolyn Brooks and Robert Hayden. I think that this was the bridge that we needed. This was the burgeoning and precious seed without which you would not see Inside Out, you would not see Cave Canem. These things could not have happened without this woman who taught us um, how, to, how to love, 
how to love. Thank you for your contributions to American poetry, to African American writers, to American culture and American literature itself. I pray for your continued health, strength, and beauty. And we have an award. The first annual Inside Out Literacy Legacy Award, Naomi Long Magic, October 28, 2010. Star by star, my heart spreads flaming wings. <laughs> for somebody like that. Because it's not just you start it because you think of an idea. This kind of sustained um, life choice, you, you make it, you, you, you become, you go to that place where you make this, and then you make it every day for the rest of your life. And I just think at some point, she saw what was missing. And she said, I'm not going to live in a world like that. I mean, I think it's almost like a life or death moment. You, you, you may not recognize it as that, or maybe you do, but there's something so profound and so deep that you see is missing. And it's so agonizing to you that you can't live in a world like that. And that's where the genius happens. That's where you say, I'm going to change this. When we look at the work that Naomi Long Magid has produced over the years, it is a significant body of work. Uh, and one has to, I think, pay very close attention to what it is she's asking us to perceive and to understand. But it is a major mind at work. I'm very pleased with the fact that I have published some very, very good poets. Somebody else might have done it, but the fact is that I did. And whether there are great sales or not, these books are on the bookshelves of the world. This is really what she was meant to do. This was her calling. Uh, it was going to find her at some point and pull her along. She's published tremendous writers. She's done a heck of a lot. And she's pretty much done it single-handedly. When I look back and see what my life has meant, what I'm living for, what is important to me, what I'd like to be remembered for. And uh, it is to be of service, to be a good role model, so that uh, I can lead people in the right direction and not the wrong direction. But. It is to serve and to make a difference in the world, a positive difference in the world, to leave behind something that is good. She doesn't think that uh, age or any other obstacle has slowed her down because she doesn't see any impediments before her. I'm really glad she's going strong. We have more to come. You grow old in years, you don't have to grow old in spirit. Someone mentioned a poem, I think it's in Connected Islands, Attitude at 75. In this recurring dream, I am Tina Turner, flinging my wild wig at the world, strut stomping across the stage on mini-skirted gams, ageless and untamed, completely in command, and belting out my song, What's Time Got to Do With It? <laughs> I don't know what they expect an old person to write, but I still write love poems. And uh, they might wonder, well, what's that old lady know about love? <laughs> no, we'll understand it better by now. Oh, so 
are made to be for what all this word and seed and we'll wonder why the test when we try to do our best but we'll understand it better by and by yeah. 